Okay. We have Yossi for the first session. Welcome. Oh. So first of all, I'm happy to be here. This is my first time, not in Paris, but here to this university. Very interesting, very nice experience. And I will talk about magnetic impurity and chiral induced spin selectivity effect, which is a subject which may be related or is related to the main topic of this uh, workshop. And I think with, I have collaboration, of course, with Michael and Eric, but I think that we can, this discussion in the week that I'm here, follow, uh, find other connections. So I want to introduce you to this subject, and then let's, well, uh, I hope it will be followed by other discussions. Oh, it's not switching somehow. Okay, so special thanks to the quantum impurity meeting, to Misha, to Claire, and uh, the University of Paris de Clay. This is my group, or part of my group, and we are quite a large group, and I'm collaborating with Ron Amman, Dave Oldak, Oded, Neil, Misha, and many others. So our group is quite large, so we're working on quantum devices, we are working on quantum biology, but then spintronic, this time I want to talk mainly about the chiral induced spin selectivity effect and how we may use it to control and align uh, magnetic impurities and maybe with uh, some uh, connection find a way to use, control, to use or, or manipulate magnetic impurities. So if you start about spintronics, spintronics is a science which uses spins and not electrons. Most of you work with spin over what spintronics. But you should be aware that in spintronics, in principle, not that people are now have real devices other than the memory devices, the giant magnetic memory devices. And of course, here it's important because the Nobel Prize is part, of, Fred is part of this university I understood yesterday. But because in principle, in spintronics, you can uh, go to less, uh, you can reduce the scattering and work at higher frequencies. In every electronics, we are limited by the, uh, we are not limited by the thermodynamic limit. We are far beyond the thermodynamic limit of any memory, but in spintronics, you can in principle get closer to this kind of, to this limit. And the thing I want to say about spintronics is that maybe with our effect, we can do it in a very easy and efficient way. So the motivation is really to go into this kind of spintronics or into spin oriented device. But this is a chiral molecule, and the chiral molecule can, uh, I will show you that we can control spins and control defects using electric and spin orbit effects. So anyone who deals with spin orbit effects, local spin orbit effects, can maybe use this kind of material towards getting it easily reproducible, inexpensive, and maybe symmetry breaking at the nanoscale. And this, I think, is the most relevant thing to the people of this. So let me talk about the cis effect. I know that some of you are already expert and we have some uh, theoretical papers together, but the cis effect is quite simple. If you take chiral molecule, and note that every molecule in biology, almost every molecule in biology is chiral, and we have, we think that we know now why biology is chiral, but I won't address this in this talk. But if you take any chiral molecule, a molecule like this, ah, See here, any chiral molecule, the red molecule you see here, any chiral molecule is, is, let's say it's a helix, it doesn't have to be helix, any way you break the symmetry between right-handed and left-handed, the mirror hand symmetry, like those two molecules, you will have, if you drive current through that, and the current is a, has the electrons of fermions which are spins and also maybe bosons, you will get a spin selectivity. And this is very, uh, very efficient spin selectivity. You can get almost 100% spin selectivity whatever you drive current through those kinds of layers. And this is mainly because if you think about it, the most easy explanation, if you think about it, you force an electron, let's say a fermion with a spin to go in a very narrow direction. In the electron rest frame, you have a huge magnetic field. It's a thousand or 10,000 of Tesla spins because the molecule is around one nanometer. So you have a large spin orbit coupling, 
which differentiate between the two. So I know now uh, Nareg and Misha may tell us that the, the spin orbit is not large enough and you need to add additional things like the substrate is very exosymmetry and dissipation, but in principle, the, 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 the effective magnetic field that you have for an electron that goes to those red molecules is huge. This spin orbit coupling breaks the symmetry and any current that will flow through those kind of molecules or chiral oxide or any chiral stuff, and this may relate to chiral magnetic stuff, will be spin selective. And it's very, very efficient because you don't have any scattering backwards. If you think a little bit about biology, if you want something, a protein which will be conducting, you don't want large current, you don't want very efficient current. What you want is something that any charge that will start going through those molecules will reach the end. You want to be stable against changes and against noise in external conditions. In biology, it's called it homostatic. In our case, it's stability against uh, scattering because you cannot have backward scattering unless you flip the screen. You cannot have elastic backward scattering. So chiral molecules or chiral or a potential is a very efficient spin filtering device. You have to preserve angular momentum. If you want to think about scattering, you think about a football which is rotate. Let's say you throw a football and it rotates and it, because you need to preserve angular momentum it begins against scattering. So this is why this potential is why it's very, very important. The effect is called the chiral induced spin selectivity effect. It was uh, explored uh, for about 15 years, but 11 years ago, there was a, this nanoletter which said, let's take a double strand DNA. This is a substrate. Then you take an, a magnetic substrate, you drive current through the magnetic substrate and you flip the magnetization. You can choose which spin will go through the substrate. In one case, you will have high current. In the other case, you will have lower current. You will have almost 100% spin selectivity in several cases. You can do devices. This is a middle picture of this. You can bring a device, just take a magnetic substrate, chiral potential, chiral oxide, chiral molecules, drive current, and you have a magnetization up or down of the magnetic layer. If you drive the current to the minority, you will have high low resistance. If you drive the current to the majority, you will have low resistance. And you can build both uh, electrical and optical memory out of that. And those are some papers that are dealing with electrical and optical memory that we have been to this study. So just show you a different example because the subject of this talk is different. But this is a, this is a magnetic nanoparticle. You have chiral molecules polyalanine, which is alpha helices, just simple molecules sitting on between. You have a magnetic, the, the, the nanoparticle is magnetic and you drive current. If the nanoparticle is magnetized in the up direction, you will have lower resistance. If it is in the down direction, you will have high resistance. It depends on the chirality. And, then, and you can build a memory device, a two level memory device with the size of 30 nanometers. So just to summarize what I was claiming so far, what I was saying is that take a chiral potential, the chiral potential drive current through the chiral potential, you will have efficient spin selectivity because of preserving spin orbit coupling or because maybe of spin orbit coupling, it's an effective magnetic field and you can build a devices, a very efficient devices out of this for spin current. And if you have any questions, please stop me because I tend to speak very fast. Okay, so I want to show another, just another set of device before going to the uh, to the uh, real punch of the talk. And this is a two terminal device. Here you have a uh, two contacts which are 30 nanometer or 10 nanometers apart. We put carbon molecules on top, which we know are very efficient spin filters. We put just one nanoparticle on top. And this is a magnetic nanoparticle. This, the gold with the magnetic with chiral molecule is weak magnetic. This is large magnetic. So this is a constant magnetic field. This is a weak magnetic field. And by doing this simple device, you have a giant magnetoresistant device, something which behaves as a membrisco as a two level device. You can switch depending on the current direction and the size of the current, the magnetization from up to down. So you can do it in a very, very simple way. 
And it's much simpler than standard spintronic devices. If you want to know why it is not going to in industry, the main problem is it is so far we use molecules. Molecules do not stand. They cannot go higher than 100 Celsius. The industry uses use oxide, which should go to 500 C. And now we are developing chiral oxide that can solve this kind of problem. But the, the, so those are many devices that I'll show you. And I hope you convince you that they're quite nice. You can have a two level system. But this workshop is about <coughs> magnetic impurity. And those are about impurities, quantum impurities. I want to talk about magnetic impurities. And what I'm showing here is so different kinds of skermions or different kinds of magnetic impurities. And I want to ask the main question, would a gate, a simple gate with chiral oxide or chiral molecule, will be able to uh, have an interaction with those magnetic impurities or can we control those magnetic impurities, have them very efficiently, then closely packed together using those chiral potentials that I've showed you. I don't have an answer for this question yet, but we are working on it because we just started but I think that, I think that uh, this answer is very important and could be related to the things you are talking with because we can selectively absorb the molecule on any magnetic surface. It could be paramagnetic, it could be ferromagnetic, it could be uh, super paramagnetic. The chiral molecule change the magnetization of the surface and their nanometer in size. So we can control magnetization in the nanoscale if the domains are this kind of size. So I think we may build an interesting system for study which are relevant to this workshop. So this is a question I want to ask. Can the chiral induced spin selectivity effect, the, effect, the efficiency of spin selection through those chiral layers enable to control and manip manipulate so this is not a silly question because, not because I'm asking it, but because we have several results. I hope I have convinced you, or at least I, I talked too fast that you didn't have time to ask questions, that by putting chiral molecules on, uh, that by passing current to chiral molecules or to chiral potential, we have spin selectivity. But not love, let's say that a chiral molecule gets closer to a substrate. You have polarization, which means charges are going through this molecule. The polarization will induce spin separation. And Areg and Misha have proven together with us that uh, if you have spin polarization and you have dissipation, you have, you have exactly spin polarization. So you have these two molecules getting closer, you have spin polarization. And this spin polarization will interact with the magnetic substrate with exchange, during exchange interaction and will create a magnetization of the magnetic structure. So we can induce, in principle, magnetization at the nanoscale. The first experiment with showing this kind of effect is this kind of experiment. This was done by us about four years ago. And here you see a ferromagnetic, a very thin ferromagnet. And on top of the ferromagnet, you see we absorb chiral molecules, and those are square micron by micron chiral molecules. And there are two elicities. One is the L elicity, which means it's a polyalanine, which rotates right. One is left handed, and right is right handed. And the only thing you break the symmetry is a chirality, which means if you believe in spin polarization, then we one will have one spin polarized, and the opposite will have opposite spin. And if we think about exchange interaction of the Pauli principle, we think that in one case we'll have one magnetization, in the opposite case we'll have the opposite magnetization. And those are the results we got. We are we're able to switch the magnetization of the substrates. The magnetization is out of plane. And we were able to see in one case up magnetization, in the second case down magnetization. So we're able, in, in principle, to enforce magnetization just by absorbing molecules on top of the substrate. So this is what the experiment, we absorb the molecule. In one case, we have the red molecule that spin up and the exchange interaction enforces one kind of magnetization. In the other case, we have a spin down and then uh, the, the effective magnetic was the opposite case. So, so once again, these are non-magnetic molecules, but- These are non-magnetic molecules. Right. There's nothing magnetic about those molecules. They're Nevertheless, just, they're yeah. just left-handed to right-handed. Yeah, just left-handed to right-handed. Right. So, so this is what's nice about it. There's nothing magnetic at all. 
you can ask how do we break here time reversal yeah. symmetry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but since I'm used to this thought, I'm used to people asking that. So I have three answers for that. First of all, it's uh, here to print on the magnetic substrate. So there's no, in principle, there's no time magnetic symmetry. Uh, time reversal symmetry. We have charges which are going through, so we have current. And we think that we have dissipation. That the, uh, but in principle, you, you stabilize the magnetization. Uh, so, oh, okay, so this is out of uh, an out of equilibrium situation. It's out of equilibrium situation. It's a metastable state. That's a metastable. So, so how do you so how do you pass current current through the system? So we, here we this is what nice about here we don't pass current through the system other than the polarization which occur when you absorb the molecule on the system. The mo when the molecules are polarized, when they get closer to the system, the substrate, uh -huh. they get polarized. Uh, the polarization is changing. This is enough to create because of dissipate, out of equilibrium dissipation spin polarization. And because of the interaction with the substrate, you get a metastable magnetic state, which oh. can be measured. This is room temperature measurement. Oh, I'm, well, that, well, this is where I'm confused. So this is an out of equilibrium situation, but there, certainly there is a, you, you don't pump the system, right? You, no, so here not. In, in the other cases, yes. the memory devices, we do pump the system with yeah. current or with light. Great, but then there is some relaxation time and it is going to relax to yeah. stay, to, well, after some time it will relax to, to the yeah. state. So yeah. in principle, yes. Okay. Uh, we did have kind of one with Misha and Alex, maybe Alex will talk about it. This is the, because of dissipation or relaxation. You have spin. Uh, you have a, a, the spin is separated in real space, and then the relaxation time is quite long. Uh -huh. And there is a work, not ours, so I cannot vouch for it. They say that because of thermal fluctuation, it's stable for a very long time and it does not stabilize. Because any time it's it's an interesting system. In one, if you have fluctuation in one direction, one thing they go to. In the other direction, the opposite spin. So any thermal fluctuation will stabilize the spin. So in principle, it's metastable, but in room temperature, you will have a stable spin polarization. Wow. I, I will show that example that in our case, it's metastable. Okay. But it's those, those are good questions. And it's very good because if you think about spin torque transfer, you need at least or something like 10 to the 6 ampere per centimeter square. Is 10 to the 25 electrons per centimeter square. We use chiral molecules, about 10 to the 13 molecules per centimeter square. So we are missing 12 orders of magnitude. So in principle, it's a very efficient effect. And you need to add maybe some kind of fluctuation or dissipation to have this kind of spin filter. Uh, but we do see real magnetization. Here you see the, the blue and the black magnetization curve. And after absorbing the chiral molecule, you see a shift in magnetization. This is acting like a real ferromagnet or a real magnetization effect. At least for a wind. <laughs> now they a small star. It's for a thin layers. Outside magnetization, the easy axis should be more, more or less or very close to out of axis. The layer should be seen enough. So it's a very efficient effect. And actually, again, a, a mass which is not related to this talk, but actually we're able to uh, <coughs> publish a paper in science on the opposite effect. Because now, if you take a magnetic substrate and absorb chiral molecules, and let's say we have the two chiralities, the left and the right, the magnetic substrate can separate between left and right. So you will, you will have different interaction between left chiral molecule. Here, let's say we have the singlet phase, a larger force of interaction. And the opposite will have a triplet phase, a weaker force of interaction. Why is it important? Because I, biology is chiral, I told you. Life is chiral, starting from the very simple life. Let's say the coronavirus is chiral, but also we are mostly chiral, proteins, sugars, and amino acids, and all that kind of thing. Uh, oligopeptide, and we so we are chiral. But if you do ke chemical synthesis, let's say for drugs, for foods, for uh, for everything, you get for spirality because you don't break the symmetry. So separation techniques are very uh, they are very much needed. And drugs, for example, most chiral drugs are, are trying to be separated. Uh, if you don't separate chiral drugs, sometimes you get very severe side effects. 
uh, and many, many, and of course, food that we eat, the modern food is chiral, and it's a lot of time, if it's not coming from biology, it's not separated, and actually this is not good. So the opposite effect, working on magnetic effect, the opposite effect enables separation. What you see here is L, let's say, look at the top panel, if this is L polyanel 9 and, a, and, and L polyanel 9, but you magnetize the subset in different direction. And in one case, you have a lot of absorption. This is marked by silicon oxide particles. In the other time, you have very few kind of absorption. So this can enable separation, again, by the triplet uh, or thing that uh, 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 Sugar molecule is not conducted, so we can't separate sugar. Actually, we have the work on separating sugars. It's not conducting, those molecules are not so good. Uh, DNA is not conducting very well and we did separate DNA and uh, sugar molecules, we do see now a very small separation of sugar. But, but, but the main problem of this method, you know, we, I have a start and something of this method, so I know a lot about this. The main problem is it's a surface effect. So think about it and think about Avogadro numbers, it's 10 to the 23. And here you have 10 to the 13 molecules per centimeter square. So it's working very well, but think about 10 to the 10 centimeters that you need to separate an Avogadro number, which is about a gram of the material. And now the industry wants tons of material. <laughs> so you have a problem. So there are ways maybe to do asymmetric synthesis and you and do a crystallization where there you have just need a, a, a seed and then it goes by itself. But it looks more promising than uh, now is, but maybe it will be better. Now these are the Japanese companies that we really buying our company, so maybe <laughs> they will do better. Okay. But now we ask about time reversal symmetry, and we did an experimental with uh, Nir Bargil and his NV center. And what we ask ourselves, let's absorb the chiral molecule on the substrate and ask ourselves exactly what it was asking if it's changing with time or not. Let's absorb, and we, with the NV center, we can measure the magnetization direction all time. The molecule get tilted over time, and we ask ourselves, is the molecule, was, will the magnetization will be tilted? by the Kerl molecules or not. So NV, I, I think in this uh, community, it's, it's quite well known, those are magnetic uh, or, or pin, it's a, a, a diamond and you have a nitrogen vacancy and you can have a spin state in the vacancy. But what we are looking at is, is measuring this exact spin state and we are sensitive to external magnetic fields. So actually we are using it as a local magnetometer or 3D magnetometer, wherever we have magnetic field, the, the, the lower level splits down and we have a splitting of the field. And this splitting is a through the Zeeman effect related to the magnetic field. So we can have a 3D magnetic mapping of the field. And what we did is we, we calibrate, we did a substrate with NV centers or with NV defects, so this nearby building, and we calibrated the substrate so we know more or less where where are, the, where are the, the defects are. So we know the three dimensional picture of the, of the magnetic field. <clears throat> and we took our sample, absorbed the chiral molecule on top. We know it's a magnetic sample because of the chiral molecule. And in part, so we know, and we measure the tilt angle of the chiral molecule each time. And in, in, in parallel, we measure the magnetization. And by uh, doing some kind of simulation, we, we know the exact angle of the magnetization over time. So now to, to, to make a long story short, what we did is measure it over time. And we know that the magnetization is getting weakened over time. So it's, again, it's a transient effect. But we also measure the magnetization on the angle that increases over time uh -huh. uh, on the, So we know the magnetization angle changes with time. So all we had to do is take an AFM and measure what the magnetization angle of the chiral molecule layer. And we see that the both are behaving more or less the same. So it's a metastable effect, but it's a quite strong metastable effect decayed with time because we are able to tilt the easy axis of the magnetization with time. So the change forces which are quite strong with this kind of force. And if you want to ask yourself how strong are those exchange forces, eh, we can do this also measure this 
and this is the next measurement I want to show. So the magnetization is meta stable and seems to break T to the thermal fluctuation or something else. But we are on a magnet and we have dissipation, so we are not in an equilibrium state. And this is the paper I was referring to to Arag, and I don't know Arag if you want to talk about it, but this is the paper we were talking about. How could we break the time of reversal symmetry uh, with a magnet and with this kind of dissipation? So in principle, this molecule does not break, of course, time reversal symmetry. It's not a magnetic molecule, but due to non-equilibrium and the current which flows through it in the dissipation, it can break or change the magnetization of the substrate. And of course, the molecule size that you want to know, because if you want to control magnetic impurity, the molecule size is about one nanometer, two nanometer in diameter, three nanometer, four nanometer in height. So you can have a very dense uh, layer of those kind of molecules. And then it depends what magnetic impurities you are working with. So the next thing we have done is we try to measure those forces directly. And the thing is, you can take an AFM tip, here you see an AFM tip, and put a chiral molecule at the end of the tip, and then put an adsorbent on the substrate and try to pull. If you have an exchange interaction, like we say, we'll have, if it's a magnetic substrate, we'll have different forces between the up magnetization and the down magnetization. So this is exactly what you have done. On the side, you see the tip. We have had to put a spacer because you don't want the non-specific forces uh, but the interaction to, to interfere with. You put a chiral molecule at the end of the spacer, and you put the sample into the ethanol not to have any effect of uh, water absorption and so on, and you put it on a magnetic substrate. So if you are correct, in one case we'll have a, in one case, in the left case, we'll have a, a triplet-like state. Hey, I don't just say it very left, but in one case we'll have a triplet-like state and loyal forces. In the other case, we'll have a singlet-like state and stronger forces. And we should be able to map locally magnetization in principle at the nano cell, but also we can measure the kind of forces we are dealing with. Again, the tip, the magnetization, the measurement performing liquid, and also the result. And you see with up or down magnetization. So the, left, the right side of the, of the control, this is with non chiral molecules sitting on the tip. And there you see only the non-specific forces as the electrostatic forces that you have between the tip and the substrate. But on the left side, you see the uh, exchange forces, the non-specific forces, but also the exchange forces. And you see a difference between up and down magnetization. So it's a la very large difference. And you see that those forces are quite large. So even if it's metastable, it's stable long enough for us to measure. And those are huge forces. This could be also, if you go back to biology and you think about protein folding, this is a new force because this is, means that chiral molecules which fold have an interaction which relates to spin exchange. And this is a directional and very strong short length interaction. So again, this is the experiment, this is the force. And if you want to measure the difference in forces, it's about 150 milli electron volt in energy. You take the integration on the force and the distance, so you can have an energy scale. And this energy is about seven times the room temperature energy. So it's quite high. The exchange forces are quite high. <coughs> so it's quite strong. And we have shown the, uh, that we could map locally a magnetic field. Here you see a calibration sample of magnetic force MFM, this magnetic force microscopy. And there the tip sits far from the surface and it has a large domain size. So it's not exact. So this is the magnet, the lowest panel is a magnetic force imaging. And there you see the stripes which are equal in distance, but there they are not equal. But when we map, uh, we, when we do the mapping uh, by force, Scale of this uh, uh, atomic force exchange microscopy, we see very local imaging. Does it decay with time? Yes, after one second, the uh, force disappear, and this is the time that we see this. So it's metastable. So, so, so far, I, I, we did another, just a very short experiment. So, so far, we, uh, we showed uh, that we're putting on the chiral molecule on a ferromagnet, and we measure the Kelvin force, the warp function difference. If you put chiral molecule, we see difference in the potential of the Kelvin force, the warp function between up and down magnetization. And this difference disappear after 10 nanometers of gold substrate 
So we know this is again exchange forces are very strong and very short range. So, so far, I hope I have convinced you that uh, we have spin selectivity going through the chiral molecule. And, and uh, we have spin selectivity going through the chiral molecule, and we have very strong spin exchange forces between those two chiral molecules. Uh, and we have very strong spin forces between those chiral molecules and uh, for ferromagnets. But the last part of the talk before I will give you time to ask questions is talking about superconductors. Because if we take superconductors, we, we have no magnetic magnetic system. Of course, as a standard superconductor, we have a Cooper pair and we have both spin up and spin down in the pair. And we absorb the chiral molecule on this kind of superconductor. So here we have no magnetic substrate, so we do not break time reversal symmetry because of magnetization. And we have just chiral molecules sitting on the superconductor. So this is a niobium superconductor. It's a standard S type superconductor, but you have other type of superconductivity, the D wave and the P wave, which are non standard superconductivity. And in principle, if you take those superconductivity and depending and you measure, take an STM measurement and measure the gap of those superconductivity, you can have in-gap states because depending where you go, you can have in-gap states. And this is important. You can have a peak, if the P wave, a peak in the density of states if you go inside the gap. So in principle, in the S wave superconductor, a standard superconductor, you will have a gap. For P wave, you can have in-gap so those are the measurements, the first set of measurements we have done on superconductor. On the right, the blue one, you see, the, this is the STM measurement. So it's a, you measure the, the density of states and you see a gap of the niobium. So it's a standard S-wave superconductor measure at four Kelvin. So this is why you don't see a fully gap states. You have a room temperature, a room, a four Kelvin temperature, <laughs> not yet room temperature, maybe with the chiral molecule. So, and you see a standard S wave superconductor, but when we add the chiral molecule, you start to see a peak in the density of state. So, something is different in the order parameter of the superconductor when putting uh, uh, the chiral molecules on top. And again, uh, we have a paper uh, with Arag and Misha talking about it. So, you can do a device and uh, you can put a superconducting where this iodine selenide. You are sitting on the, on the device as a chiral molecule sitting between, and again, measure the current through that through a tunnel junction. So, you have a way of measuring the density of states with some uh, voltage that is falling on the tunnel barrier. And you see a peak in the density of states, but this peak disappears at lower temperature. So, again, it's follow up that we have a new kind of superconductivity, probably a P wave superconductivity or chiral P wave superconductivity with lower critical temperature and a new order parameter. So you break, because of the chiral molecule, you break the symmetry of the surface and you have another type of superconductivity. So ju ju yeah, just to understand the geometry of your experiments, you have the two dimensional niobium film. Yeah. Right, okay. And you, you put chiral molecules on top. Yeah. Okay, and where do you put the STM. The STM is on top of the chiral molecule. So we so, don't know if you measure currents right. through the chiral molecule. These okay. are tunnel there, but we don't know if you measure. Okay, so okay. Those are the properties of the chiral molecule. It's a hybrid chiral molecule superconductivity right. okay. system. Okay, so it's, it, it is quite likely that you do not see the superconductor directly, but you see the proximity effect in the chiral. It's a proximity effect. It's a proximity yeah. effect. Okay. Yeah, but, but we do know that if you put on a very thin layer on the other side, we do see the effect. Of, it's an it's effect which penetrates to the superconductor. Uh -huh. I will show, I will show a proof okay. of that. Okay. But, but yeah, but it's a proximity, it's some kind of a proximity effect. We do have also a measurement of gold. We added the gold and then put the chiral molecule and we did see again a is this peak in density of states. So uh -huh. it's a real proximity effect, but it's, it's some kind of a system. Right. And those of you who didn't notice uh, this uh, flake, we use only those kind of flakes because it look like we, this is exactly the map of Israel more or less. Here we don't have the Golan height, but we control the part of Jordan to, to, to replace it. 
Okay, uh, but I don't know if you know how the map of Israel looks, but this is very, very similar. Okay, so, so this was when we put a full layer, we asked ourselves, let's put just few parallel molecules on top of the superconductor, and then measure, a, 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 again, it's a device, so then measure the transport through this kind of device or, or the, the density of states through this transport, and we see an in depth states. So I don't know how many of you work in superconductivity, but those in depth states are very similar to what showed the Shiva state. And those Shiva states are acting as, as you have magnetic impurities. So we took a non magnetic molecule, the chiral molecule put it on a superconductor and got a magnetic like impurities. And if you are not convinced that those act like magnetic impurities, have a look, this is a gap before adsorption on the top. After adsorption, you will see a, a, those kind of states. And if you take a magnetic field and map those kind of states, you see the standard splitting of a Shiba state. And you have even an hysteresis of going back and forth of those kind of Shiba states. So you break the symmetry for a Z direction, but of course, it's symmetric because the Shiva state is symmetric to those spin in that direction. So this is uh, some kind of theory that we did with uh, a lot of from a lot from Ben Gurion University. It's also the measurement, and we have a breaking of symmetry due to those kind of Shiva states. Uh, so we know that at low density, we have like a ferromagnetic island, a Shiva-like state sitting on. Or oh, it's like magnetic impurity sitting on a ferromagnet at high density, it's behaving like a, a, a standard P type superconductivity. And to prove that it's behaving like P type superconductivity, there is a, a, a prediction that if you have a chiral P type superconductivity, you break the symmetry between right and up magnetization and down magnetization. And if we look at those peaks of, of those kind of devices, this is a device with two kinds of, with a box sanitized with graphene and chiral molecules and niobium, we do break this kind of symmetry. So we believe we have a chiral P type superconductor by absorbing those kind of molecules. So we end before uh, giving some preview with showing that it's indeed uh, penetrating to the superconductor, it's not just a molecule which are uh, affecting this kind of states. And this is a, a immune scattering experiment. So if you don't know how to measure magnetization, you can use immune scattering. The muon is coming to and uh, hitting the sample and then positrons are emitted. But since, uh, you, uh, but since you have precision, you have a spin. So they're sometimes emitted more to one direction than to the other. So in principle, if you measure the absorption of, of those muons as a function of time, you get oscillation, and those oscillations are a function of the local magnetic field. So we can do this cutting, and if you expect, let's say, for a superconductor standard Meissner scaling, you will see decay of this kind of scattering. So this is what you expect. But what we show that with Carl molecule absorption, we are penetrating to the superconductor uh, because of the, the muon, uh, because of the absorption. So it's a really penetrating for 10 or 20 nanometer into the superconductor. So I hope that in this talk, I have been using the magnetic impurities on an iobium, we have a new type of superconductor or Shiba kind state, it's a P wave superconductor. On a magnetic substrate, we can switch magnetization. We can use electric field to, uh, to have magnetization or on a gallium arsenide. And if you ask yourself, can we manipulate fermions? I don't know, but we do know that adding chiral molecules on, 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 a, scale, on, on a magnetic, uh, magnetic substrate that has fermion, we are changing the properties. What we do have is I don't know. So just to summarize what are the future ideas for this kind of effect, we are thinking about uh, using power magnets to have local gradients of magnetic field. We can control the magnetic field just by putting a gate so we can have large local gradients. We will use ferromagnets to have memory and use antiferromagnets to write and read from a, from a antiferromagnet. Antiferromagnets are good for memory devices because they can be much more dense. We don't have cross correlation between what I'm expecting. They will have superconducting and magnets and magnetics to have a superconducting synchronic. 
and we use multi-gated devices. So I would like to summarize before the question. We have long-range field exchange interaction in child molecules and can be used to control and manipulate quantum magnetic impurities, which I hope to use with the cross and cross resistance with your kind of workshop. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, just a naive question. I remember in uh, D wave superconductors or close to the superconducting state, there's some uh, question about chiral state current uh, that were probed or discriminate using uh, uh, chiral photons. Yeah. Is your device a way to probe this kind of states or? I think I think first of all we, we we what we did is we induced chiral state on the standard state way of superconductivity. But I think yeah, those all things are are, are uh, relevant and in in uh, are talking is what we are talking about. So the main question of what I I were trying to do now, and actually we wrote a proposal, is trying to take all those chiral state in the super in the D wave superconductor if. People agree with the RD wave, or in some cases, there are arguments. And the chiral magnetism that's happening in magnetism and try to see how they interact with our uh, chiral molecules and artificial chiral object. And I think it's related, but we don't have a proof of that yet. You need a theory somehow. What? You, you need a theory somehow. Yeah, we need a theory. Actually, there's no for that, for those kind of interactions. Yeah, I would be very happy to discuss that. Actually, I came to this workshop exactly fine way because I want to use this system exactly to do those kind of to study those kind of interactions. But the only thing we did is they take they took a took from Matthias Chloe for mines a material which has chiral skermions and show that these chiral molecules we change the properties, but we didn't we don't have any theory uh, interaction. I came here. I came here exactly for that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And to the critical temperature dependence on the on the coverage by the by the molecules. If you add more molecules to a superconductor, what happens to the to the hey. critical temperature? We, we didn't do, actually it's a very good question. What, what we saw and we think we saw that the critical temperature decrease when we change the order parameter to the critical temperature. Mm -hmm. but we didn't study all the phase transition between the Shiba-like state to a Shiba, uh, Shiba pen. And it's, a, no, we didn't do that. It's an interesting question. We do that. It's not easy, but we do that. Okay. If, you have, if you have some kind of prediction, we will give it very helpful. Yeah, the, the, the question that I don't understand. Okay, you, you, you essentially from you, you can adopt the point of view that what you are doing in your experiment, you are putting a lot of spin orbit interaction on top of superconductor. So yeah, the molecules have an in, internal structure, but their effect boils down to adding a lot of spin orbit interaction. And, and there is a big uh, again, the, 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 there has been a lot of research on what's what the spin orbit interaction that does to superconductivity. Uh, but you could also argue that what you are seeing is some sort of non out of equilibrium effect, which then is something completely new. And, and, and this is because you have your molecules are big, 
and the relaxation is slow, so you are seeing something. Something. Yeah, I think it's not just spin orbit coupling. And uh, Arik, if you want to also add your point of view, please do. But it's not the spin orbit coupling because the spin orbit coupling, of course, is needed to have to break the symmetry. Yes. But afterwards, you have spin polarization. So, so I don't know if it's just spin orbit coupling or real spin exchange interaction. We do have experiments we are doing now, and I didn't talk about about weak localization. We, we wanted to answer exactly what you are asking. So we took gold and other and uh, copper, both are the same metal, but one with strong spin orbit coupling and one without. And we did see big differences, but we need to check if uh -huh. it's because of spin orbit or because of something else. Right. So, but, but it could be that we are putting a large spin orbit coupling. Or, yeah. Alex? There. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, agree so. with this uh, point of view? Well, I will add when I talk because it's, <laughs> in any case, I'm going to present the same issue. So. Ah, okay. 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 <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> so I will continue those same issues. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Please not serious. Please, please. We do the experiment. <laughs> So, okay. If we don't have questions, please send for this presentation. Right.